Hallelujah, John. Praise God for this resurrection, man. Stand up and deliver this, would you? Hebrews 9. Verses 12 and 14. Okay. So those who have strength should turn to this. Hebrews 9, verses 12 through 14. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. 14. How much more will be the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. They don't sit, John. Deliver. You've read scripture. That's the first step. Show us your profound understanding now by making a point. Well, I struggled with this last night. Hallelujah. Praise God for those words. Huh? But it's through the blood of Jesus, his death, has entered into the holy place brings about our uh, cleansing from conscience and dead works and, and then serving the living So John, the question on the table is, what has sin now done to the human race at this level? That Jesus, by the offering of his life, is addressing. This is John's moment in the sun now. Come on John, you live in Bakersfield, it's a hot place. What has sin done to the human race from within now? It's not just placed the human race under a death sentence. It has affected us internally. And what is Jesus addressing here through the impartation of his life? No, it's too broad. I want it out of the text that you just read. Come on. Listen, listen. You're allowed to go to the other side of the coin, remember. If you see the benefit, you can look at the other side of it as well. Well, it says, talk about cleansing your mind from dead work. You're a person of dead work. False. Everyone pray for John now. <laughs> and you've started to hit it on the head by that last statement. We are people of dead works, but tie it together with the benefit, even a little more clearly for us. The benefit here is that through the, the life of Christ now, we are privileged to have a cleansed conscience. Our dead works is removed from us, which is in the mind. And then we'll have, uh, then we can serve the living God with a clear, clean conscience. So, why don't you just make a simple statement about the quality of the conscience of people before Christ comes into them. Before Christ comes into them, it's dead. There's nothing in that conscience. It's, it's worthy. It's a conscience of uh, sin. So it's a dead conscience, okay? It's a dead conscience. I can buy that, okay. I can think of other words. A, a defiled conscience. I like defiled better, yes. We have a very confused conscience. A defiled conscience. The human race, I remember that statement in the days of Noah, all they wanted to do was evil continually. That was the human conscience. It didn't really see the distinction between good and evil. It had lost that capacity to determine. Thank you, John. You've done very well and you've got the wheels turning this morning. Now you're on track, right? Don't take me back. Well, you're jumping ahead because mine says most holy place. Uh oh. She has the NIV. You've got the NIV, have you? Or oh, the New King James. You need to know something. And we'd have to pick up Paul in Hebrews now. There is no veil in heaven. The, the, the veil in heaven in Hebrews is called the flesh of Jesus. So when Jesus ascended to heaven, he ascended to what place? No, give me scripture now. What place did he ascend to? The right hand of the throne of God. The divisions, which are artificial, we could say, were in the earthly sanctuary, which is not the original. The original is in heaven.
So we don't have those divisions in heaven. What we have are the different aspects of his ministry. So it's an interesting observation. So don't be thrown, because Paul's going to mingle words holy and, and most holy here, but he's simply referring to the right hand of the throne of God where Jesus is. Okay, so I can take that, but now I want to put a practical thing. I'm in Christ's righteousness, I'm in the holy place, and I sin. <coughs> I make a mistake. So you're deviating me now. There's a question out here and you're not answering it. I warned you. You have to answer the question I'm posing at the moment because I've got a question on the table and I can't take these deviations at the moment. I'm under pressure time-wise. I will address this hopefully, but I, I have a question out there and I want it answered. And the question is, what has sin done to the human race from within? that the magnificent life of Jesus has addressed. So I'm looking now for more scriptures. Let's go to the Philippines and see what they're thinking there, okay? It's in Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, let's hear it please. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, mm -hmm. whom so you haven't really got anything in that text on this side of the board. What has sin done to the human race? Because when he says the life which I now live in the flesh, he's simply addressing being a human being. He's not pointing out sin there. I want to know what sin has done to the human race from within, in here, in every respect. And Jesus, by offering his life, has now addressed it. I want to know this. Okay, we've got a hand over here. Yes. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, and there's a couple different verses here. One, first one is 14. Okay. Um, for by that one offering he for, forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And it goes on into verse... Um, so there's nothing in there meeting our criterion yet. Okay. The new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord, I will put my law laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds so I believe that's what's happening you still haven't given me the two sides of the coin I've got a very strict criterion here I want to know what sin has done to the human race from within now and what Jesus has done to address it by offering his life now the only thing that's come out concrete wise yet is the fact that our consciences were distorted. And through the indwelling Christ our consciences are cleansed. We are now able to distinguish between right and wrong. So that's the beginning of understanding. Uh, there's a hand down the front here. What have you got for me? Got John 8.12. John 8.12. Okay, let's hear it. I am the light of the world. But he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So I'm saying I take on his image. When people see me, they're saying, hey, you're the man. I, you know. If you don't hang in with the text, you're in trouble. You'll go the way of all flesh. You've left the text and started into a beautiful little commentary here. I'm looking for something coming out of the scripture now. So don't read a text and then depart from it. Stay in it and make a point, please. I'm toughening up here this morning. I'm the light of the life. Yeah, shall have the light of life. There is a point in there, actually. You have incredibly landed on a good verse. What condition is man in? The light. I know. <coughs> no, that is not true. Man, by nature, was not in that condition. That's what's happened when the light comes into him. What condition was man in? Read the verse again. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the so light. So man's condition was what? Darkness. Walking in darkness. Okay, man was in darkness. He was indeed. That was John 8.12. Man was in darkness... But Jesus, who's also known as the light of the world, Amen. came into human hearts and man began to walk in the light. 
So man moved from darkness to light. Okay, we've got... It's a little point here, but it's a good one. I wish we'd get something substantial out here about what sin has done to the human race. Okay, we've got a hand over here. Go ahead, yes. I didn't hear that. Say it again. Stand up, would you, so the whole world can hear you. Ephesians 4... Okay, let's hear it, please. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Wow, congratulations. You've got a pretty serious passage here. So give me a summary. What, what do you want me to put up here? What was man's natural condition? How was it described? Listen, listen. And what other words we use? We're corrupted. We're following the lusts of... Yes, okay, this is a condition of man in his natural sinful state. And he's offered in, re in return through the life of Christ. He's offering to create in us the likeness of God. Oh, wow. And, and how is that brought to us? I thought there was a reference to the mind there. Ah, thank you very much. God offers us a renewed mind. And it results in what? Now, give me the other words you used a minute ago from the text. It results in? Oh, is that what it says? What verse was that? Uh, oh, yes. The new mind and the likeness of God, which was created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Thank you very much. Excellent passage here. Excellent. So man by nature was corrupted. His mind was filled with lusts. God offers him a new mind. And we've already looked at that. Whose mind are we putting on? Christ. The mind of Christ. And when you put on the mind of Christ, it brings you righteousness and holiness. Amen. In truth. It's a powerful verse. A powerful verse. Wow. I never heard what verse that was. That was Ephesians 4. 22 through 24. Thank you. Thank you. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. All right, Karen, your hand withered. This is unusual for you, but uh, there it is again. Stand up, would you, so they can all hear you. Um, I was just looking at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Um, 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Okay, read away, please. So make your point, please. There's a beautiful statement there we'd love you to pluck out. We were walking in the darkness of our, trans, our trespasses. What's the actual phrase there? Dead in No, in transgressions. What was the phrase? Dead. Dead in transgressions. And we walked according to the course of this world. And what does he offer us? Together with Christ. Thank you very much, Karen. Okay, alive in Christ. Wow. Oh, you were dead. It's, it's interesting to me that no one's put out the really big gun yet of what sin has done to the human race from within and what God is offering us. I mean, this is a big 16-inch gun. Have you, are you sure you've got it? <laughs> <laughs> Give her another shot here. She's such a good participant. Okay. Ezekiel 36, 26. Our hearts were mummified in sin. It was a heart of stone, but he 
He's giving us a new heart of flesh in Jesus. Okay, oh, she's on the t on target this time. Summarize that for us, please. What summary are you going to give us of that? Uh? He's doing a heart transplant, not a surgical one, but a spiritual. Oh, okay, a heart transplant. I love that, a heart transplant. Okay. Ezekiel 36. 26. Thank you. Ezekiel 36, 26. We were mummified. Isn't that an interesting word, huh? Mummified. Oh, I just see myself all wrapped in. I, I was in Egypt once when they unwrapped a mummy. I was fascinated after 4,000 years you could still recognize the features. Mummified in sin. Wow. There's still a big gun yet that I wish would boom. I mean, a really big gun. Right at the back there. Romans 7. It takes a lot of courage to get to jump into Romans 7. Stand up, would you, and deliver this. Uh, well, we need to know what verse you're in. Huh? She's in Romans 7, 14. Okay, let's hear it. Sold into you. This is the point I was hoping would come out. Don't sit, you we're not done with you yet. You know? <laughs> Sold into sin's power. And what does Paul say in another place? In what condition? What word does he use? In slavery to sin. Yes, we're sold into sin's power. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, for the desire to So have you got the other side of the coin for us as well? On one hand, we're in bondage to sin, we're in slavery to sin, we're sold into sin's power. Are you going to leave us there or what? Well, who will rescue me from this body of death? That's what we're asking you. <laughs> who will rescue us? <laughs> well, don't finish there. You've got to finish that verse now. Come on. So God puts his law in our minds. Alright, now I wish somebody else would add another verse to this because on one hand we're in slavery, but what about a verse that actually says we're set free from slavery? Let's see how many hands. Have you got that, Marjorie? I just read it. Romans 6, 18. Romans 6, 18. And having been set free from Okay, okay, very good, very good. And this adds to the beautiful scripture that came out from the back row there. So we were once slaves to sin, but now we become slaves to righteousness. Yes, powerful statement. In slavery to sin is now becoming slavery to righteousness. I'm running out of space here. I hope you're looking, by the way, at all the things that have been made available to us. Nobody has especially yet produced a lot of scriptures that talk about the fact that it's Christ in us who is doing these things. It's implied all the way through, but I could handle hearing some scriptures that actually point to the fact that it's Christ in us and his magnificent life that's making these things possible. In the back row there, Mark, okay, good to see you, man. Let's hear it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 10. Stand up and deliver, would you? Romans chapter? Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. Chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. Okay. For those who are according to the flesh, who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, and indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, 
Though the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. We're glad you went that far. Praise the Lord. Huh? If Christ is in you, even if the body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. I'm finding, by the way, that people who are in the deepest pits of sin are the ones who come most alive when you offer them the privilege of having Christ in them. I wish you could hear the praise from this young man in Palm Springs who's calling me daily and just lifting up his heart and praising God that Christ is alive and well within him. It's so exciting to hear praise like this. All of this is done through the life of Christ implanted in us. So whoever is reaping the benefits of his death is privileged daily to put on his marvellous life. And remind yourself, it's not me getting stronger or more holy every day. It's me learning to get out of the way so that Christ can dwell in me by faith. It's Jesus in me who radiates holiness. What a feeble response to a statement like that, huh? Wow. It's Jesus in me who radiates holiness. It's Jesus in me who radiates love. It's Jesus in me who is hungry for souls. It's Jesus in me who has purity of mind. So if there's any goodness, any holiness, None. Any righteousness visible in any of us, it's not of our own doing. It's an evidence of Christ in us. Amen. The hope of glory. glory. The hope of glory. This is a huge section we've just covered. Hallelujah, we've gone through two sections of the sanctuary. Was that a, a further comment yet? Stand up and deliver this, would you, so the whole world can be edified. Uh, one. Speak up a little. <coughs> Colossians 1. 13 and, 13 and 22. Okay, she's making a leap of faith here. Hang on, hang on. Give us a moment to find this. Colossians 1. And you're reading verse 13 to begin with. Okay. All right, let's hear it. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Wow. Oh. He has now reconciled in you his fleshly body to death. Now this is verse 22, huh? Yes. Okay. Let's hear it again. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body to death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond so Jesus is planning to present us holy and blameless. blameless. Wow, holy and blameless. John, that's a very serious yeah. look you've got there. 27 and 28. You're still in the same chapter? Yeah. Okay, the same chapter, 27 and 28. Okay. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope and the hope of the glory. To proclaim him, admonish every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. Amen. Wow. Every man may be presented in what condition? Complete. Complete in Christ. The daily ministry is to bring about our completeness in Christ. Turn to Ephesians 3, one of my favourite passages, where he also describes this in such beautiful language. Ephesians 3. Beginning with verse 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory 
to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in what? Love. In love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be in what condition? Filled to what degree? Hear it, you may be filled to all. Did you realize that God is offering you the fullness of Himself? The fullness. That blows my mind when I think about that. God is offering me the fullness. And all of this, that Christ, by dwelling in my heart through faith, is going to lead me into such an understanding of the love of God. The love of God, which surpasses all understanding. Wow. How's your love factor? Are you seeing evidence of the love of God? I mean, the evidence of the love of God in us is revealed by the fact that we can love the unlovely. We can forgive the unforgivable. We can be reconciled with the irreconcilable. This is what the love of God does. We cease to judge. Because we recognize we haven't walked in another man's shoes. And when that young man told me that he'd been sexually abused by a Catholic priest for eight years, beginning at the age of eight, I said to myself, God, forgive me for ever acting hastily in judgment towards somebody who may be engaging in a practice that I find offensive because I have not walked in his shoes. And I started saying, well, what if I've been abused like that for eight years? Beginning at the age of eight, taking you through puberty. Imagine the orientation that's happening in the life of that young man. And I asked God to, to make sure I never commit such a grievous sin as to act hastily and, and judgmentally until I've at least walked in somebody's shoes. And once you walk in somebody's shoes, have you noticed how compassionate you become? Yeah and the love and understanding that God puts within your heart. So how many of you have, you have ever had a serious enemy? Am I the only one who's ever had a serious enemy? I had a serious enemy for 20 plus years. He happened to be one of our general conference leaders. And we sat on committees together for years when I was living in Washington. We never had a serious personal difference, but we certainly knocked heads on many, many issues. But I started traveling around the world and I started hearing the things that he was saying about me. And you know, we have roots in the same part of the world, interestingly enough. And I didn't know why this man felt that he had to do this. So I went to him three times. And I said to him, what is the problem? Oh, there's no problem. I said, between you and me. Oh, we don't have a problem. Well, I said, I'd like to believe that. But as I travel around North America and other parts of the world, people relate to me the things that you're saying. And I'm saying to myself, we must have a problem. And I'm the kind of person, if you tell me about it, I'll make it right. If I've done something to offend you, please tell me. No, there's nothing there. Three times I went to him and three times he denied that there was a problem. So I was having a seminar in Southern California. I have very good friends living in this church. And whenever I have a seminar weekend there, I stay with these friends and Saturday night... She puts on a really lovely dinner party. She knows that I like to sit down at a table that is nicely laid. And so she pulls out all the stops, brings out her best dinnerware. There's flowers on the table. There's candles. It's just gorgeous. And I'm the guest of honor. And on this particular weekend, she said to me, we have a big surprise for you tonight. I said, oh, goody, I love surprises, you know. 
She said, we have a visitor from your part of the world. I said, oh, fantastic. I was getting excited, you know. Until you saw him. She said, but we're not going to tell you who it is. We're going to surprise you tonight. I was held up at the church. It was like 8 o'clock at night. I finally arrived at the house. And there's a dozen people there. They're all sitting around the table waiting for me. And I'm at this end of the table, and the other surprise is at the other end of the table. <laughs> and I looked up at the other end of the table, and there is public enemy number one. <laughs> and of course, my friends know nothing about this. And we can fake it pretty well, you know. I walked up and gave him a hug, and you know, we greeted each other as though we not only knew each other, but we were old friends. Ha <laughs> ha. And I sat down at the other end of the table. So we had a blessing and we started to eat and this guy started, the way that he does, he makes little cutting remarks about you in front of everybody and I'm just sitting there saying, God, give me the mind of Jesus that I don't respond to this, you know? And God's been good to me because Jesus in me, I've learned, doesn't respond to something like that. And so I'm not responding and then the most surprising thing happened. In the middle of dinner, this world leader breaks down and starts weeping at the dinner table. And all my friends from this church are shocked and embarrassed. They don't know what to do. And they're all looking at me because I know him. <laughs> I'm the only person sitting there who knows why he might be so emotionally distressed. He's just been through a very painful divorce. Even his children had turned against him. And, and I could sense some of the pain that he must be feeling, but I remained rooted in my chair. Mm. And so God sent the Holy Spirit down to me and he went, knock, knock. I said, there's nobody home. Because <laughs> I know where God's going with this and I don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, God says, come on, come on. I said, no way. <laughs> I know exactly what God's going to ask me. God says, this man is in great pain. I said, yes, he's in great pain. I agree with that. Well, God says, I'm planning to reach him. I said, I'm sure you are. <laughs> well, God says, I've decided to use you. I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> but the only thing is, this man would never let me minister to him. For 20 years, he has said all these evil things about me. And I give God the glory for this. God told me I was never publicly to respond to this and for 20 years I never made a single statement. That's the grace of God, isn't it? Yeah. But it was painful to know that he wasn't acknowledging that we had a problem. Yes. Anyway, God says, well, I'll cut through it all. I am planning to use you. And I said, okay, what do you want me to do? God says, I want you to get up out of your chair. I don't know about you, but I couldn't raise myself up out of the chair. God says, you need a little help? <laughs> I said, I think I'll, I can manage it. I finally forced myself to stand up. And God said to me, go to your enemy, put your arm around him, and lift him up in prayer right now. He's dying. He's in the most incredible pain. It's an interesting thing that God lays this on you, isn't it? Because I realised that God was doing this primarily for me as well, you know? Because it's one thing to never publicly say something about your enemy, but it's another thing to love your enemy. That's a different matter altogether. So I left my chair and everyone's watching me. And I walk up behind this man and I just put my hands on his shoulders. And I leaned over and I whispered in his ear, God has just asked me to come and minister to you right now. I hope that is okay. And there's a moment's silence and he looks up at me through the tears in his eyes and he says, please do. So God knew what he was doing as usual. So I knelt down with my arm around my enemy and prayed for his healing and restoration and I could feel the power of the Holy Spirit and I knew that God was being very gracious to this man 
And I finally finished praying for him and we stood up together and we hugged each other. And I whispered to him, I said, you know, I hope this means that we could be brothers together for Christ's sake and for the sake of his people, you know. And he just grinned at me and he said, why not? And just like that, 20 years of pain just fell away. Amen. Fell away, totally. I've never questioned him more about it. I still to this day don't know why he felt that he needed to do this. But God said, let it go. 20 years dropped away. And this man said to me as he was leaving that night, he said, if there's ever anything I can do to help you in your ministry, please don't hesitate to call me. I will be available. And, and since that day, we've just had a, a good working relationship, you know. Isn't God gracious, huh? This is the grace of God. But Christ had to come into me to get me to even move out of that chair. Because <laughs> you can imagine it was the last thing I wanted to do because I felt he would reject me if I made any approach to him. But God knew that he was actually very vulnerable at that moment. I give God great glory for these opportunities because like you, I am in process of growing up in Jesus in all things. And the good news is he ain't done with me yet. You know? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Huh? Yes. Now tomorrow morning, the entire focus is going to be on the most holy place. And it's absolutely essential overnight that you have another sleepless night. And you seriously address what barriers. This is a huge thing now, and it's easy to miss this. What barriers between God and man is Jesus addressing in the most holy place? This is the biggest question of the week now. What barrier? Seventh-day Adventism has been given a remarkable understanding of the plan of redemption. That God has lifted everything that sin has placed us under. He's lifted it by putting it on Christ. Our death, our guilt, our condemnation, our judgment, everything has been heaped on Jesus. We have been freed up so that we could now become partakers of his marvellous righteousness. The very life that Jesus perfected in the flesh. Sweating and with tears, crying out to his Father. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered, just so one of these days he could become the author of life. To us, because Jesus knew not only would he be lifting all this, but he knew that what he would be offering us here would be his own hard fought character. Amen. He knew that, so he persevered, knowing that the day would come when he would become the author of life, the author of salvation. He would impart to us his own beautiful holiness. Hallelujah. So that not over yet. So that something absolutely amazing can happen here. The investigative judgment will come up tomorrow morning. It has to come up. Any question as we conclude? There's a lot of visionary looks out here. Any question arising? Once again I have spoken with absolute crystal clarity apparently. <laughs> Of course there's a question, yes. You don't want me to ask this question, but in practical terms, we've been forgiven, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. Yes. The Holy Spirit is what gives us the power to forgive. Yes. 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 About the, no, this is serious, about the formation of new habits, responding to the same trigger, but you respond differently. 
and intelligently in such a way that your response actually magnifies God and brings glory to him. And we need to intelligently address issues in our lives. If they keep popping up, we have not yet taken the time to establish a new habit to replace the old response. It's very important. That's why in Romans 6, uh, he uses the continuous tense in Greek, yield yourself or keep on yielding yourself because to whom you obey, his servants you are. Continue to present the members of your bodies as instruments of righteousness. Emphasis on the continually doing it. This is habit formation. And from my experience, anything like that that keeps popping back up, you can be confident you have not addressed the habitual response that you're in. You can't erase those habits in the brain, but you can replace them with a new and better response. And it can be the same trigger that's triggering you, but your response will now magnify God. I wish I'd known about habits when I first became a Christian. Seriously. So it's an excellent question, by the way. Excellent. And if necessary, after you've reflected on this overnight, I'll be happy to bring it up again because it's a, it's a very significant question you've raised here. So sin is a habit. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Yep, it is. yep. Because we're not robots. It's like having a new captain with his hand on the steering wheel, but he won't force you to go a certain direction. He will prompt you. He will convict you. He'll even show you with clarity the path to take. He'll even offer to empower you to make it possible. But you're the one who intelligently makes the choice as to whether you're going to continue allowing the old ways to keep popping back up even inadvertently, without thinking, sometimes they just trigger in, you know. Listen, listen. Can you speak up a little more evangelistically? Thank you. Romans 8, 6, she's quoting. Powerful passage, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. By the way, uh, in my two books, Victory in Jesus and Overcoming Through Jesus, I address this issue. They're both on sale at the ABC. Plus a lot of other materials. There's this new series that's just come out, the new DVD series, uh, Inspired by the Spirit. It's probably the single best series God has given me in the last year. Powerful at the, at the Washington, uh, Seattle, Washington camp meeting last year. That's also available over here. It's called Inspired by the Spirit. If you want information on where we're heading here, what's the name of that series, John, about uh, Adventism? Uh, the Relevance. The Relevance of Adventism. I've got a whole series out now called The Relevance of Adventism. That's CDs, right? Not DVDs. CDs, yes. And what's the other new series we've got out? Um, the Holy Spirit series. We have a refreshingly new spirit. Is that, do you mean inspired by the Spirit? No, Holy Spirit series. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit from a new perspective now is also out. Yes, there's much material over there. I suggest you have a look. But if you're seriously interested in, in victory and overcoming, I've written these two books right on that subject. One is designed to be given away especially to your non-Adventist friends. It's the same message but it does not have the Adventist history in it. 
That's called overcoming through Jesus. But the one that has the Adventist history in it is, is a victory in Jesus. The, the other series that I'm recommending to you today is what's our Revelation series called? Uh, perspective, new Perspectives of Daniel. New Perspectives in Daniel and Revelation. And these are new insights into the principles of interpreting Daniel and Revelation, an area that I am moving very boldly into at the moment. Any question on what I've just said? Yes. Can I, can I make a statement on the most holy place? No, in the morning you can. I mean, on the holy place. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Speak up a little. Yes, it is. So when we look mm -hmm. at that most holy place, there's an experience that we're going through that it's not just pleasant. Okay. We're not supposed to be surprised at the fiery trials. No. So I really appreciate associating Hebrews 5 with Powerful that. passage. And character is basically formed through affliction. Let's face it. It's not formed in, in times of ease very readily. Thank you for that, Karen. Excellent insight. Any last comments as we conclude? Anthony has come to life. Thank you, God, for this resurrection. Okay. As, as she was saying that in the holy place, it's our suffering. Turn around a little, buddy, so they can hear you. Thank you. As the woman was just saying that, you know, in the holy place, it's our suffering as well. Um, and it just brings to mind Colossians 2, 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now the circumcision is coming from God or the Holy Spirit. Now again we know that in the Old Testament circumcision of the flesh, literally, it was a painful one. And you know that as a child too, you circumcise someone. Now as the flesh is doing that to us in the spirit, it's also hurtful because it's a process that we're going through and it's the flesh will things that we don't want to let go. It's, it hurts us, but it's Christ that's working with us to let those go. All right, beautiful. Thank you for that. So on this last note now, as we conclude, don't miss this statement. The whole time you are going through the process of sanctification. Growing up into Christ, it's a daily thing throughout your entire life. The whole time you are going through this process, you are not condemned. Amen. Just let that sink in. The whole time you're going through this process, you're not condemned because your condemnation has already fallen on Christ. If you mess up, you make a mistake, you don't lose all of this because you did nothing to gain it. You come in repentance to your father like our sister back here pointed out. You seek his love and forgiveness but he doesn't yank away from you all of the blessings of the cross. This is not once saved, always saved by the way because you have to remain at the cross. I'm going to make this statement again. The whole time you are growing up into Jesus, becoming like him daily, you are not condemned as you go through the whole process. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Because your condemnation has been lifted from you and placed on another. And Paul covers this when he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's the condition, that you remain in Christ. Amen. So my single biggest challenge in life is not to become more holy, but to remain in Christ every day of my life. Amen. To come to the cross and to just thank God from the depths of my heart for what he laid on Jesus and lifted from me 
and ask him at that very moment to bring Jesus into my mind for another day. I want Christ to be in me because that's the key of me being in him. If Jesus is in you, the Bible says you are in him automatically. So I'm going to say it again as we conclude the whole time. You are growing up into Jesus. You are not condemned. Amen. By the way, that means you're free even to make a mistake. And God will not kick you out of home because you make a mistake. He'll pick you up. He'll put his loving arms around you. He'll restore you. And he may even teach you how to avoid those mistakes. Amen. That's how gracious he is. But he will not heap condemnation back on you again. Because you are in Christ. Well, on such a positive note, let's stand together, please, as we conclude today. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask Evangelist Marjorie here to close in prayer, please. Thank you. Speak into that. Thank you. Hopefully the mic is still on, is it? Is the mic still on? I think it got switched off. By whom? <laughs> probably me. I probably picked it up and did something. He handed it around. He gave it away. Look, Marjorie has it. Marjorie has it. Marjorie has it. No, no. A little box. Is it back here? No, no, not that one. It's the other one. It's the other, the other one. one. How many do you have? Not this little one, no? No. It's the one that. It's in here. Where is it this one. To? How could that get turned pack. off? Maybe the battery's died at this crucial <laughs> moment. <laughs> it's on? Is it on? Hallelujah. Yes, yes it's on. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, we've got it. Let's bow our heads together. Thank you very much. Oh, our dear loving Heavenly Father, what a journey that you're giving us this week. I just praise you, Father, that you have given us the mind of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus took it all at the mm, cross. Mm, mm. And we come to elite to the cross. We have that assurance mm, that he mm, would mm. continue to give us the mind of Jesus every day, every, yes, every hour yes. of the day. And I plead for all of us here right now that we will be blessed by the Holy Spirit mm, through mm, this mm, mm, and continue to grow and to praise the Holy Jesus mm, for mm, what mm. he has done for us and what he is doing for us now and, <laughs> and continue to grow Amen. in you and the Amen. kingdom. We praise you, O oh Father. Amen. Thank you, and we ask it all in the name of Jesus. And the, everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Have a blessed day at camp. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, here they are racing to grab their.